Hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Lars Schall. I am an independent financial journalist from Germany. As you know, we are approaching this month the 50th anniversary of the assassination of John Fitzgerald Kennedy, the 35th President of the United States of America. And therefore, I have invited for a conversation on that topic two outstanding researchers related to that matter. Matthias Bröckers from Germany and Peter Dale Scott from the US. Matthias Bröckers is an investigative journalist, book author and editor who has published a few weeks ago here in Germany a book with the title JFK, Staatsstreich in America, which would be translated into English as JFK, Coup d'etat in America. Hello, Matthias. Hello. And then we have Peter Dale Scott with us, a former Canadian diplomat and professor for English at the University of Berkeley in California. Moreover, Peter is a poet and researcher who has written many, many books, amongst them, for example, Deep Politics and the Death of JFK and the War Conspiracy, JFK, 9-11 and the Deep Politics of War. Hello, Peter. Hello, Lars, and hello, Matthias. Okay, gentlemen, we have only roughly 45 minutes, so let's start. I think a good way to kick off our discussion is to address the following. Why does JFK, his presidency, and his death still matter? Well, <clears throat> I, I can give both internal and external reasons. Externally, it was really a chance in his presidency to defuse the Cold War and uh, bring down the level of armaments in the world. Uh, what happened after him was partly successful, that, that is to say that Lyndon Johnson uh, in, continued to improve relations with the Soviet Union, but we have not seen a, a kind of reduction in armaments that we might have seen with Kennedy. Perhaps more importantly, domestically, <coughs> there were secret powers in this country that uh, were able to arrange the assassination and to get away with it but in order to uh, avoid prosecution, they have continued to put themselves above the law. The visible demonstration of this is that we have thousands of pages about the assassination in documents which should be released by the CIA and have not been. And if domestic law was prevailing, uh, they would be required to release those documents, and anyone who obstructed justice in this respect would be themselves guilty of a crime. But we now have a situation, this is the most serious consequence, we now have a situation where certain agencies like the CIA, it's not the only one, are now above the law. The NSA is another example. So that is perhaps the most, that was something that was beginning to happen anyway, but was enormously accelerated by the unsolved assassination of President Kennedy. Yeah, Matthias, how would you answer this question? Yes, um, <clears throat> I think uh, to, uh, uh, to solve the Kennedy case and uh, to analyze it, is uh, very important uh, uh, even after 50 years because um, this was uh, a covered operation of uh, the military and the secret service and um, in my opinion it was the first one which took place in the United States itself in the years before they did it uh, in some South American countries, in Iran, and so on. And that's why my book is called Coup d'etat in America. Then they did it at home. Killed this president because of his, of his politics uh, uh, to, to stop the Cold War, to stop the confrontation with the uh, Russians. And... Um, if we if uh, if Kennedy's murder is not solved, uh, if there is no um, opening of the documents, uh, there, there must be, in my opinion, a new investigation of the whole case. If if this is not happening, then um, these covered operation uh, and Peter named the NSA, which is a new thing we 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 know now. Uh, this will go on and on and on. 
And uh, I think uh, the Kennedy case, uh, uh, therefore, is a very important matter. And um, I'm a little depressed uh, at the moment uh, because uh, if I read, <coughs> excuse me, if I read all the media and press outlets these days, I, yeah, I get sad and depressed uh, to read all this bullshit uh, and uh, so very, very few journalists which take their job seriously and uh, the most of them they repeat all the uh, Warren Commission stuff and telling the people we will never know it might be another shooter and so on it might be that the Secret Service was involved or the CIA or whatever but we will never know this is the style and and the um, uh, uh, the way uh, how it is featured in the media now, and this is in for me, it's very depressing. Yeah. Well, I, can I comment on that? I, I yes. have uh, been depressed for decades, but I am less depressed right now than I was, say, 25 years ago. Uh, <clears throat> it is actually, uh, we saw a book by a, a, a major journalist, uh, David Talbot, called Brothers which became a bestseller in the United States and uh, it has opened up the mass media a bit to uh, considering that there is something wrong with the Warren Commission report. Uh, National Public Radio had uh, an interview a couple of days ago with a, a man who had been with the Assassination Records Review Board. I would say that the situation is looking up and Another thing, um, to pick up on what Matthias was saying, uh, we have had other events since uh, the, the Kennedy's assassination, which uh, are so similar in their modus operandi that I think that, uh, I suspect they can be attributed to the same dark forces in our country. And that is the... <coughs> the, the a, a very urgent reason to investigate the Kennedy assassination. I sincerely believe that if by understanding it better, we will also understand better what happened in 2001 with what we call in English 9-11, the attack on the Twin Towers and the Pentagon, uh, because there are similarities in the way that those conspiracies were constructed. and. Uh, arrows pointing to uh, the same sources, particularly one source that I have written about, the emergency network that was created outside the regular government network for communications, which figures both in the Kennedy assassination and in 9-11 and even in Watergate. So uh, I think this is a very urgent reason why we have to understand all of these things if we don't. Um, what do they say? If you don't understand your history, you're condemned to repeat it, and we have been repeating it. Yeah. Uh, before I continue with my next question, I want to thank you, Peter, for uh, mentioning Mr. Talbot's book, because I see it as a silver lining too, especially since it was now uh, produced as a film. And I will uh, provide a link to this uh, website, Brothers, The Hidden History of the Kennedy Years. Um, but I think another important issue to address at the beginning is that I ask you, Peter, why is it of essential importance in this and other similar cases to distinguish between what you have coined deep political, deep state events and quote-unquote normal conspiracies? Um, <coughs> well, first of all, let me say about deep politics in general. Uh, there's deep politics in every country, of course, but where you have countries with what I call uh, excess power, more power than is needed to regulate their own affairs, the United States being, of course, the best example of that right now, uh, then deep politics uh, becomes uh, more important in the background than the public politics of the constitutional state. And we have, uh, so as a result, what I call a deep state, um, 
which is generating these kinds of conspiracies. An, an, an ordinary conspiracy is one which can be contained within the legal processes of the constitutional state. But if you have excess power in the background that is not restrained in the same way, then these things are not checked, and that's why people like Matthias get so depressed. Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, I could I could uh, uh, um, uh, add to this that uh, if you if you look at at uh, uh, certain uh, points of what Peter is calling deep politics, uh, especially uh, uh, the war on drugs. I just had a lecture uh, some uh, uh, weeks before in Vienna uh, talking uh, on the uh, war on drugs and uh, on the example that the German army, the Bundeswehr, is now uh, um, hosting uh, the biggest opium uh, production uh, of all times in Afghanistan. Uh, she's not. Uh, 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 it's not fighting it. It's hosting it and and taking care of it. And if you talk uh, on this point to a politician, asking him why is it so, he said, "Yes, I, I cannot tell you. Uh, this is this is crazy, but this is war and so on." Uh, um, if you uh, and and if you counter this and say yes, we need this war on drugs uh, uh, because uh, we need to finance all these illegal wars from Vietnam to Afghanistan today, then they shrug with their shoulder and said yes, maybe you're right, but we cannot do something. Yeah, and uh, um, every every politician or, or official you talk about this. Uh, um, they agree that it is that you are right, but uh, uh, in the next sentence they say yes, uh, but we cannot do anything about it. And, and this is a clear sign that there is uh, there are some powers uh, uh, um, which are not in the constitutional or democratic or parliamentarian um, uh, 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 power to, to, to control. They do what they want and they need, uh, for example, this war on drugs to keep the prices high for cocaine, heroin and so on and to pay the warlords in the countries where they fight illegal wars. Well, I basically agree with that and I think it's entirely relevant. Some people may be surprised that we're now suddenly talking about the war on drugs but uh, I am pr totally convinced that it is uh, part and parcel of the deep power that we're talking about in America. And I think America is the source of the problem here. The CIA has relied on armies abroad that are financed by drugs since almost the time that it was created. It happened first in Thailand, and then it happened in Laos, yeah. and then and, uh, things were calming down in Laos and the uh, drug traffic was coming, uh, waning in Laos, suddenly drugs uh, are being grown and exported for the first time in a major way from Afghanistan. And then we have a war on drugs, uh, which uh, puts people there. It, we have two wars uh, started by America. The war on drugs, which has resulted in a vast increase in the quantity of drugs. And we have a war on terror, which has vastly increased the amount of terror in the world because for sure. every, every man you kill with a drone, you've created 10 new people who want revenge against the, the country that, that was responsible for this crime. So we have to look at the whole <coughs> scale of, uh, of violent activities which co have contributed to what I call the American war machine and here, I, it's uh, to the shame of me and people like me in this country that we have not been able to wake up America to this problem because the problem is America and the solution, if there is ever a solution, will also have to come from America. Yeah, and I think we also have to keep in mind that the Vietnam War caused uh, a big explosion in the production of opium and heroin. And so the question, uh, I think, should be 
what was actually JFK's politic uh, policy towards Vietnam at the end of his life? Uh, yeah. this is, uh, is this to me? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, to you both. <coughs> yeah, I think uh, it's finally, Oh, sorry, Peter, please. Uh, there is finally a consensus growing among historians that uh, Kennedy was never very keen on putting American troops into Vietnam in the first place. He was determined that they not fight a hot war. He wanted them in an advisory role when the military, the American military kept pushing the envelope on that and you actually had Americans not just training pilots but actually flying planes and dropping bombs and so on. But these were very small planes in the Kennedy era and uh, Kennedy as early as 1962 had authorized plans to begin getting even the advisors out and uh, you have two famous documents, uh, National Security Action Memoranda, we call them NASIMS for short. The first one was in October, which authorized uh, the uh, withdrawal of a thousand troops by the end of 1963 as the first step in a longer program of getting the bulk out by the end of 1965. That was NASM 263 of October, and then two days after his assassination, you have a second NASM, the first by Lyndon Johnson, and though it doesn't go immediately over to war, it, it wipes out the decisions of the first National uh, Security uh, Action Memorandum. And uh, so you do not have the withdrawal of a thousand troops, and at the same time you have the beginning of plannings for escalating the war against North Vietnam uh, through a 30, what they call 34A operations, and those operations escalate through 1964 until finally in August 1964 you have the American provocation which leads to the Tonkin Gulf incidents and the beginning of a hot war against North Vietnam, which of course uh, was a disaster for everybody concerned, not only the Vietnamese, but also for America. And it's amazing uh, if one looks at the uh, articles now uh, on the 50th anniversary of the assassination, uh, that a lot of uh, historians and also also journalists uh, deny that Kennedy had any plans uh, to go out of Vietnam, not to escalate the war. Uh, uh, and this is against any uh, historical and documented evidence, because if you look at the work uh, of Peter or uh, the work of uh, John Newman who, who wrote uh, JFK and Vietnam um, you you have a clear uh, uh, side that that JFK uh, wouldn't have escalated this war and um, the discussion is still on uh, 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 and and this is in my opinion um, a kind of of uh, 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 they, they they try to to discriminate uh, all the critics of the Warren Commission and the Lee Harvey Oswald uh, stories. Um, Oliver Stone did in his did his, did this in his movie, and and uh, a lot of other people like we uh, uh, we are discredited uh, with the argument. No, 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 uh, JFK wouldn't uh, have gone out of Vietnam. He, he would, would have made anything uh, uh, what Johnson made after him and so on. I think this is a kind of, uh, uh, of uh, fake uh, discussion which uh, you find in every second article now on the JFK assassination, that it's wrong. Uh, um, but if you look at the evidence, it's clear it's not wrong. Kennedy was to go out of Vietnam. And if you uh, hear or look at uh, his speech uh, at the Washington University on June 10th, um, uh, this is the most remarkable speech in his lifetime, I would say. 
uh, uh, and he took this very serious. This was not a regular Sunday speech of a politician. This was uh, uh, his uh, true uh, politics. And, and if you read this speech, it's clear that Kennedy was on his way to, um, yeah, to peace. And, and uh, therefore, all the discussion that he would have continued the, the Vietnam um, aggression is, uh, is wrong. Yeah. Yes, I agree. Uh, the, um, the, the issue of Vietnam was important to Kennedy because of an even more important issue, which was avoiding uh, <coughs> the dangers of uh, another nuclear confrontation. We yeah. came so close to nuclear war in the Cuban Missile Crisis that through all of 1963 he was definitely uh, trying to mend relations with the Soviet Union and uh, was getting a response from Khrushchev. The two men understood each other. Uh, you point to the speech of June 10th at Washington University, but uh, uh, also uh, it, it seems like a small thing now, but it was very important at the time in August of 1963, he signed a test ban treaty with the Soviet yeah, yeah. Union. The issue here was not just, I mean, it was in fact important to end uh, nuclear testing in the air because it was poisoning the, 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 the globe. But more important still, it, you recognized the Soviet Union as a state that you could sign a treaty with. There had been no treaties signed with the Soviet Union since the Austrian Peace Treaty of 1955. And the arguments that happened, Kennedy was facing a lot of people who say you must never sign a treaty with the Soviet Union because they're communists, they don't believe in God, that means that they don't, their word means nothing, they can't be trusted. And by signing that treaty, he had put America on a path of normalization with the Soviet Union which, as I say, has partly succeeded. It's, it's been rocky and difficult, but it was immensely important, and, and, and it, it changed the direction of U.S.-Soviet relations at that time. And he even, yeah, he even said privately to his brother and his confidence in, uh, in this time, in, in the late summer of, of uh, 63, that uh, if he's re-elected, he will go to Moscow and make a peace treaty with the Russians. This is uh, unbelievable because we are on the height of the Cold War and this president is trying to make peace. And another yeah. thing he, he did in the same year, 1963, uh, he was friends with an author who produced a book called Seven Days in May, which was uh, a fictional account of a military coup in America and Kennedy was so worried about the real, the real possibility of that that for the first time he allowed the, uh, the Oval Office in the White House to be used for the filming of that movie and mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately just uh, making a fictional movie was not enough of medicine to prevent some kind of coup uh, from occurring. Well, wasn't uh, JFK asked what would, would need taste uh, for a coup d'etat in uh, America? I, I'm sorry. Related, uh, wasn't JFK asked, related to this book, uh, what needs to take place so that a coup d'etat in America would take place? Well, perhaps Matthias can answer that question. I, I, I don't know what you're referring to. Yeah, that, but but uh, the 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 book and the movie you mentioned uh, um, is um, uh, that he um, he clearly saw the danger of of a, of a coup d'état, and, and and therefore he 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 pushed uh, to make a movie uh, uh, from from this book, and uh, if I'm right, the the director of this movie was a friend of Robert Kennedy. That is correct, yes. And is, they were very frightened and, uh, and actually I think that was what created a bond with Khrushchev. The Khrushchev understood that he had, 
Kennedy had a military. The military, some of the generals did not forgive him for a peaceful resolution of the Cuban, Cuban Missile Crisis. General LeMay, who was head of the Air Force, said after that that America had just suffered its greatest defeat uh, he, because they wanted to use the whole situation as a pretext to bomb and conquer Cuba and felt very frustrated that uh, Kennedy had not allowed that. And actually, one of the parts of a part of the deep politics of the Kennedy assassination, as I have described it, is that some people were hoping uh, to use uh, the fact that the assassination was blamed on Lee Harvey Oswald, who had gone to the Cuban, uh, allegedly gone to the Cuban embassy in Mexico City. Uh, that they were going to blame the assassination on Cuba and uh, use the Kennedy assassination as, a ch as an opportunity to invade Cuba. So we had a very restive military, and uh, so although the assassination was a tragedy, uh, it, it could have been worse that uh, the, the hawkish generals did not get what they wanted in 62 or 63 or, or um, later for that matter. And uh, um, the, the military also played a crucial role I think in the cover-up of the murder because uh, there is evidence that uh, the general you mentioned, Curtis LeMay, was uh, at the autopsy at the Bethesda hospital smoking a cigar. And Yes, this is debated, Matthias. Not everyone believes that. But yeah. what is very clear is that the autopsy was a military autopsy conducted in a military hospital, and that it, it, the most conspicuous uh, mess or evidence of cover up is in the medical area that the uh, yeah. brain for the autopsy, the brain that weighed 1,500 grams. Well, uh, the average human brain is 1,300 grams, and the case of Kennedy's brain, about a third of it had splashed over Dealey Plaza, headed uh, into the back seat of the, uh, the vehicle, and two parts of it hit two policemen. So this 1,500-gram brain cannot have been Kennedy's brain. So, but this, this is proof that there was a military autopsy that was... Uh, controlled and manipulated to come up with a false result. They wanted to prove that Kennedy had been shot by shots from behind. And the more we pay attention to this, the more clearly he was shot from in front. And if he was shot from in front, then the murderer was not Lee Harvey Oswald, who was behind him. So, yes, the military are clearly involved in the cover-up whether or not General LeMay was in the room where they conducted the autopsy. Yes, yes, and, and the, uh, one of the, in my opinion, most important things the Assassination Records Review Board brought out, that the <coughs> pictures <coughs> of the autopsy and the abduction and the x-rays and all the medical pictures uh, 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 which, which are at the Na National Archive, that these pictures are not the originals, uh, but were manipulated, and and they have uh, the, the fo fo photographers and the people uh, which did these photos uh, at the time, and uh, they showed it to them, and and they swore swore under oath that these are not their pictures. So. Uh, uh, since uh, 50 years, we have man manipulated uh, 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 autopsy uh, documents at the National Archives. And um, for this reason, I think uh, uh, this uh, crazy uh, magic bullet tale uh, uh, could last for so long, because every other researcher is going to the archive, looking at these manipulated uh, uh, photographs and x-rays, says, yes, it could be a shoot from behind. And uh, um, so 
uh, the RRB uh, brought out that uh, these pictures are manipulated, and this is, uh, in my in my view, one of the most uh, important uh, findings of the late 90s. Yes, I agree with you, and this will perhaps cheer you up a bit, but the review board uh, <coughs> uh, officer who was in charge of bringing these uh, people to testify just, uh, I referred to this earlier, he was just on national public radio. His name is Jeremy Gunn, G-U-N-N, and you can Google and uh, read a, a, a news report of what he said. He brought all of this to national attention on national public radio. So, as I say, I think there are grounds for modest optimism that the American nation is slowly beginning to confront the facts that they were lied about at the, uh, in, in connection with the Kennedy assassination. Um, were the, was the public, for example, also lied about uh, the real identity of uh, Lee Harvey Oswald? I mean, Peter, for example, uh, can you tell us about the significance that the CIA had apparently a 201 file on Lee Harvey Oswald? Yes, well, it, uh, it, it doesn't surprise me so much that they, they had a 201 file, although it appears that they had a different kind of file for ordinary people. A 201 file was for a special category of people. But most importantly, uh, this file had been quiescent for uh, some... He came back from the Soviet Union in 1962, in the summer of 62, and then for a year, there was no activity on the file. And then suddenly, in the weeks before the assassination, there was a great deal of activity. And most strikingly, uh, a group of people in the counterintelligence uh, section under James Angleton, who is many people's suspect in the matter, uh, they start sending out documents about Lee Harvey Oswald, they send out two documents on the same day to different audiences, and the, docu the documents say different things about Oswald that are not compatible with each other. So one or at least one, if not both of those documents, was falsified. And that similar thing is happening over in the FBI, where they too have a file on Oswald, and uh, Oswald himself is becoming more active politically in the months before the assassination, and he has a debate on television with uh, a group of Cubans who are sponsored by the CIA, and this uh, debate is filmed extensively after the assassination to prove that Oswald was a communist or, or a leftist. And, uh, an extraordinary thing happens on the FBI side. As he, he's just been arrested, there are all kinds of reasons to be more interested in him than before. And a month before the assassination, Oswald is not put on a list for special observation. He is taken off a list for special, obser uh, special observation. And I think that is very important for the plot because... Kennedy was going to go to Dallas, and it was very important that Oswald not be picked up by the authorities, because if he had been, he could not possibly be what I call the designated culprit, the man they had already chosen to blame the assassination on. And what is very interesting is that when we come to 9-11, there is a similar phenomenon that people who should have been watched very closely because they were going to be the alleged hijackers uh, were actually being protected from that kind of observation. That's the kind of thing where I say there's similarities in the construction of the plot against the president and the plot to uh, uh, bring down the uh, World Trade Center in New York. Yeah, and another uh, similarity would be that uh, it was very fast clear, uh, quote-unquote clear, that Lee Harvey Oswald was a murderer, and also uh, it was very clear, uh, very fast, uh, on 9-11, who the hijackers were. 
very uh, unbelievably fast that they had identified a list of 20 hijackers before the fourth plane hit the ground. And uh, in the case of Kennedy, it was, I think, 10 or 15 minutes that they put out on the police tape a, a description of the assassin. They said he's about 30, he's 5 foot 10, and he's 165 pounds. Well, what's interesting about those three descriptions, none of them fit the actual Lee Harvey Oswald, but those are exactly the measurements and age that is given to Oswald, the, the measurements that are given to Oswald in his CIA file, his FBI file. So I think that, those, that the description of the assassin was taken off the file, was later blamed or attributed to a man who saw somebody in the six-story window of the school book depository, but he only saw the man from the waist up, so it's very hard to see how he could have known he was five foot ten, 165 pounds. And anyway, the man that they say made the identification, Howard Brennan, he went down to the police station that night and he failed to pick out Oswald in the lineup. So I think we can be fairly confident that it was not Howard Brennan who made the thing. It was somebody who was taking the description from the file. Uh, Matthias, what is your best guess uh, for the reason that the public is not allowed to take a look at the tax uh, records of Lee Harvey Oswald? Uh, the, the, the reason uh, is the same uh, uh, as with the other uh, thousands of documents which are, which are closed for the public. And um, I think uh, if uh, someone... Uh, 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 could manage to open uh, the books and the documents which are kept by the CIA and the State Department, then anyone could see that uh, Oswald, for example, was an uh, unofficial employee of, of the, uh, uh, not of the CIA itself, but of a straw company uh, paying him money. And um, the same uh, like Peter mentioned, these parallels between 9-11 and, and JFK are quite convincing if you look at them, yeah? That they had, uh, uh, the, the evildoer was announced uh, some minutes after, after the crime happened. It was uh, Osama bin Laden and the hijackers. Uh, the uh, files of FBI, CIA were closed on these two hijackers in San Diego and stuff like that. If uh, you, you can find about a, a, a 10 or more clear parallels um, how to frame a scapegoat. And uh, uh, Oswald was uh, the scapegoat and uh, he, was, uh, he was framed from the very first minute uh, after the shots, and the same thing happened with these 20 so-called hijackers. And um, that's the reason uh, uh, why I, I think Peter will agree why it's so important to look at the Kennedy case, because um, um, this is the, the very beginning of, of this kind of covered operations in the United States, and um, if you look at these parallels, you, you, can, uh, you can see it. And uh, if, if we do not uh, solve the, the Kennedy assassination, which is now 50 years gone, uh, um, how, will we, how will we ever come clear with 9-11? So, um, and it's more easy now today to talk on these uh, uh, deep state uh, uh, doings uh, uh, because this is 50 years before. If you start talking 9-11, all the people get angry and um, therefore I think it's uh, very important to look at the Kennedy case again. Well, um, Peter, I just, yeah. I want to, can I just add to that? Yes. that uh, <laughs> I and Matthias have both talked a great deal about the CIA, and it's true, there are uh, over a thousand documents, maybe 15,000 pages of CIA documents that are relevant to the case that they will not release. That is obstruction of justice, and if we had a legal system 
in charge of the country, then they, the CIA would be penalized for that. But I want to make the point, it's not just the CIA. The uh, Army intelligence were told not to destroy their files on Oswald. They destroyed them, all of them. There was a Marine intelligence file on Oswald. There were classified documents in the file, which means Lee Harvey Oswald was not an ordinary person. He was a matter of concern to intelligence people. And that has never been seen, because if we just think it was one agency, the CIA, I think we are, in a sense, underestimating the breadth, the scope of the conspiracy that managed to pull this off and has pulled off other events since and will continue to do so until uh, we can do something to expose their role in this. It's, it's, it's even the IRS because Oswald's tax declaration is still top secret. That's true. But of course, I think that would not implicate the IRS as conspirators. It would, <laughs> it, it would implicate whatever uh, company, as uh, is Matthias suggested, whoever was paying him, uh, there is a secret there that is being protected as a matter of national interest, and this, of course, should not, this should not be. Well, we, were, we are beginning to running out of time. Uh, I would like to raise one final issue, maybe. And uh, with regards to the CIA, Kennedy was quoted as telling an official within his administration after the disaster in the Bay of Pigs in 1961, I want to splinter the CIA into a thousand pieces and scatter it to the winds. Uh, would, it have, uh, would it have been better for JFK if he would have begin uh, began this action immediately in 1961? I think Kennedy realized that it's very, um, it's very difficult for a civilian. He was also worried about the military as well as the CIA. And uh, he doesn't, you know, we say in, in theory the president is the most, empower, the most powerful person in the land. My own Deep political analysis is that no, there are forces that are deeper uh, and more powerful than the state that don't really recognize the and accept the uh, sovereignty of the president as the supreme power. I've been looking a lot recently at Alan Dulles, who of course is a suspect in the case because he was the most important official to be fired by President Kennedy. And then somehow he ends up on the Warren Commission investigating the assassination instead of being one of the people being investigated himself. And Alan Dulles is very clear in his whole career. Uh, he felt that people like himself, uh, powerful bankers and lawyers, uh, they had the care of the country better understood by them than by these puny uh, people who were elected to office from time to time. So when Eisenhower uh, said, uh, I need to control all U-2 flights, for example, Alan Dulles was not upset. He simply made a deal with British intelligence that when they wanted a flight and Eisenhower didn't authorize it, then they would have the British Prime Minister authorize it. So he would just simply overrule what the President and it, that mentality was widespread in that kind of class of people, and it gave uh, Kennedy, I, I think it would have been very difficult for him, just as it's still difficult for us today, the critics, uh, to get any purchase on this. And the truth, to come back to what Mateus was saying, our best weapon to achieve something here is the truth because of the crimes that have been committed by these people. I think Kennedy was not able to to splinter the CIA in two thousand pieces. He took he took all he took not only uh, Alan Dulles. He took uh, most of his cabinet uh, uh, from the former uh, administration in the beginnings, and and even uh, 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 and worked with him. His father. Uh, uh, was still there in the beginning of his presidency, and and he. He managed all this, uh, and uh, uh, after the Bay of Pigs, and uh, after he saw how how his hardcore generals uh, uh, were working for a war, 
he changed his mind and and uh, um, then it was uh, too late to to uh, to uh, fight these powers and um, therefore um, I think um, it's tragic uh, that that uh, JFK could not do anything about it and uh, as we see with the recent president Obama uh, which came into office uh, with a uh, 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 with a saying of hope and of change and stuff like that. He didn't change anything. And um, I think any president uh, sitting in the White House has uh, the shots of Dallas as a kind of uh, reminder. If he goes out of the line of the military-industrial complex, same thing will happen with you. And so, uh, any president uh, um, elected uh, has uh, no choice, or n not not a personal choice, uh, to do politics on on his own. Well, well uh, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Please Max. go ahead. Okay. Um, well, I, I would like to ask one final question. Um, if I understood you both correct. Is it important to deal with the Kennedy assassination in order to see the connection between the success of the assassination and the fact that the perpetrators were getting away with it on the one hand and the growing shenanigans that followed afterwards on the other? Well, I feel that, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, President Roosevelt uh, said to uh, Colonel House, who was in what, his advisor in 1933? He said, uh, most, it's, "It's been a fact ever since the time of Jefferson that the country has been really ruled by a small cabal of lawyers and bankers." And uh, I think what we have seen is that that was not only true in 1933. Uh, the, 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 the nature of the cabal has changed a bit, the, the military-industrial complex, uh, new financial elements and so on, but there still is a kind of control in the country that is not subordinated to the power of the people, uh, of those who are elected by the people. And uh, the importance of hammering away at the Kennedy case is that these people in control committed a crime and got away with it. And uh, the only way we can change this situation, which is dangerous to the whole world, America is a, a threat really on every continent practically, uh, is to uh, expose what these people have done and thereby uh, limit their power. Yeah, uh, I, ha I have now uh, the, the quote here from uh, Franklin D. Roosevelt to Colonel E.M. House in, 19, in 1933, because you, you open your book, The Road to 9-11, with it, Peter, as you know. Yes. And the quote yes, is, the, and quotes, the, the quote is, the real truth is, as you and I know, that the financial element in the larger centers has owned the government ever since the days of Andrew Jackson. Okay, Matthias. Yes, uh, I, I agree totally. <laughs> and uh, uh, I would like uh, to talk more and to talk longer, but my dentist is waiting. <laughs> yeah. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, I, want, I want to thank you, and uh, especially I want to thank Peter. I owe much, I owe much to his work uh, uh, for my own. And... Um, so uh, uh, I think the only thing we can do is uh, go on and uh, fight for the truth. Well, I want to thank Matthias too because we feel lonely in this country when we who are doing the kind of research, but it, it gives us uh, strength of heart to know that other people in other parts of the world can see the same things that we see and develop and add to the body of knowledge that we are trying to assemble here. So thank you, Matthias, and others like you in Germany and France. Okay, Peter. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah. So long live the true German-American friendship.
Um, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, I thank you for listening to uh, this uh, discussion with Matthias Brokers and uh, Peter Dale Scott. And I hope you are encouraged to uh, pick up their books and some other books that are worthwhile to read. For example, JFK and the Unspeakable by James W. Douglas. Okay, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen.